Okay, you're. Okay, welcome to our uh, feed yard extension webinar series. Um, again, we've started this over the last uh, year and a half or so, and and uh, look forward to you viewing them. There's multiple topics that we're trying to uh, to come up with that at least give you a taste for the topic and some conclusions, and then point you in the direction of of places for more information. Uh, if you're watching this online and after you're done, we would sure welcome feedback on the evaluation and you can go to that web address there, go.unl.edu slash feedlotwebinar19 and there's a place to uh, give feedback for us on, on both how it was and whether it was useful and then any ideas for future topics. So our topic for today, um, if you want to advance, Rob is uh, is going to be done with Rob Eirich, who's the director of the BQA, is and, and works for UNL and is based out in the Panhandle, and Dr. Brian Vanderlei, extension veterinarian, uh, based at uh, at GP Vec out in Clay Center, and uh, we thought it would be great to discuss uh, feed yard assessments. A lot of interest in that, and and some of that from the market and and, and industry side. And so we think this is an important topic for you to be aware of and, and frankly not be nervous about. So Rob and Brian are gonna take you through some of the hows of, of doing this and, and what it's like. So I'll turn it over to you guys. Thanks, Galen. Um, as we start, I uh, just kind of get back to the basics of BQA and understanding that we are uh, the gold standard in the industry as far as animal care and well-being, And we are really, uh, influencing the safety and wholesomeness of the product that we're producing for our consumers. And so what we're really doing here is trying to uh, ensure those consumers that what we do every day really helps us in the ideas of, in the principles of putting a safe food product on their table. I think uh, as we kind of move forward with BQA, we've done a lot of training uh, and certification for BQA. And that is basically the piece that we've uh, done since the mid 80s as uh, putting together the best management practices, injection sites, labels, handling, all those pieces. And so that's what the piece of the certification is over the years. But we have also moved in a direction of having uh, creating a BQA assessment and we do have assessments uh, for uh, three stages throughout the, the cycle of the beef industry but today we're focusing on the feed yard stage but that assessment really deals with putting together some benchmarks and uh, reviewing those standard operating procedures that we do at the feed yard and understanding uh, how we're implementing those best management practices through observations, uh, kind of giving us a point of what we're doing well, or places where we need to maybe uh, improve or look at how we can change some of our management principles, uh, our, our operating procedures to do a better job in, in some of those aspects. And so uh, it really is a piece that was designed uh, within the industry and help us kind of evaluate ourselves. Um, also, uh, as you kind of look through these, this is really a kind of an operational handbook for your operation in terms of those practices and procedures. Uh, when we look at the National BQA Feed Yard Assessment, it is based on a second party or a self-assessment and that can be done, uh, we really encourage you to do that with your consulting veterinarian or, or maybe a set of outside eyes to really uh, help us be more proactive in, in what we're doing. We might not always see exactly the pieces that we need to improve on. And so that's kind of what these pieces are all about. And I know uh, Brian and myself will talk more about those pieces. But one of the things that's starting to happen is our marketplace is starting to ask for BQA assessments and audits to be a part of requirements going into a lot of our major packers. And so we have Tyson with a farm check program. JBS is now announcing uh, to their suppliers and Cargill's also uh, promote it as well with some other pieces like other marketing groups like Progressive Beef and U.S. Premium as well. So what are the elements of the BQA assessment? Employee training, reviewing of written standard operating procedures, 
ping observations, whether it be uh, looking at water tanks, cleanliness, fresh water, uh, bunk space, uh, bunks, how clean they are maintained, and then really the ping floor space as well. Uh, overall ping maintenance is a key. And then there's an observation of actually processing and handling cattle, looking how cattle are handled through a facility, uh, coming in and out of uh, the opera uh, the shoe operation and those type of things but then really looking at those procedures again how we uh, handle cattle for the best care and welfare we do have a website that has a lot of this general information on it and i wanted to pass that on but sometimes probably the place that everybody kind of uh, is scared about these assessments or gets a little nervous about them is when we start talking about standard operating procedures and having them written down in some form. And here's a list of a lot of the standard operating procedures that are required, but that list looks pretty big. But when you really look at it, uh, it's a way that you can really put together practices for your employees or everybody involved in the operation to know if we do have something happen, what is the procedure to uh, to kind of solve that issue or or overcome that or make it a better situation? And so this is a whole list, but we have tried to make it as easy as possible for you to really sit down and do this on our website, bqa.unl.edu. There's a BQA assessment page. And on that BQA assessment page, there is templates of all of these uh, SOPs that you can modify or you can use as an example to create your own. And really, it is just an operations manual for your operation. And so it's not all as, uh, I guess, as, as worrisome uh, as a lot of people let on. It's just getting it done and getting them written down. Because again, we're trying to document it to ensure those consumers that we do care and we have thought through the processes and those practices. And so that's the big key of the whole assessment. And once you complete these, there is a way of getting on the national database. And we can kind of talk about that as we wrap up. Uh, there's a national database for feedlots that have completed an assessment or an audit at this point. And uh, those forms can all be found on that same website. So that kind of gives you maybe some general background. I'm going to turn it over to Brian Vanderlei to really kind of talk about what are some of the things that uh, happen within the the assessments as they've done them on feed yards. Thanks, Rob. <clears throat> See, my slides got a little bit out of kilter there. I apologize for that. Um, yeah, so as Rob said, over the last few weeks here, it's, we're at the end of March of 2019, if you listen to this sometime in the future. And it's been kind of a rough spring here. And, and what we've done over the past few weeks has been using the feed yard assessment as a way to do some teaching for veterinary students. So it's been a really great opportunity to do these things in several feed yards, but it's, it's a really tough year. And I think that's one of the first things that we ran into with feedlots. One of the first lines in the booklet, as you read through the assessment says, these should be done under normal conditions and nothing about the last three or four weeks here has been very normal for feed, feed lots here in Nebraska. So one of the, some of the things that, that we really stressed, uh, going into these things is that it's it's a relatively simple process. We split this into three stages. We really stress to the, the owners and managers and employees of the feedlots we're working for that this is really for them. We're doing this to accomplish many purposes and Rob outlined those before, but really this is a check. It's, a, it's an assessment. It's a benchmark tool for the feedlot to, to see where they are in time right now and, and to use it as a, as a tool to make improvements over time going forward. So we really focused on the food aspect. What do these things have to do with, with the food that these cattle will eventually turn into? And that really provides a lot of uh, context for why it's important to do these types of things. So when we actually went about doing these things, we found out it's about a three hour process. Uh, we figured out that it, you have to spend some time in the office with the manager or the owner and you have to go through these SOPs. And, and one of the findings there was that almost all the feed yards have thought about and have some sort of a procedure that is understood by the employees for everything that's on that list that Rob just showed you. Most of them don't have them written down. And I'm going to try to make the case here that writing those things down is valuable not only to uh, the, the 
parties who are interested in, in using this as a tool for their marketing, but also for the feedlot itself. We also use this as an opportunity to find out what the feedlot was interested in addressing. So it gave us a little bit of a uh, look into what their questions and concerns were related to BQA and, and some other general things. So that whole process takes about an hour. You gotta spend a little bit of time at the computer, spend a little bit of time going over what they have. The next two parts are out in the yard. You have to process, or the, the assessment suggests processing or observing processing on about 100 head of cattle. Um, if they don't have 100 head total, you, you do as many as you can. And if they have more than 100 head, we tried to stay for at least 100 and a few more if we could. But essentially you're watching what's going on at the chute and back in the handling area. You wanna make sure you're looking at, as an assessor, you wanna make sure you're looking at how the animals respond and how the, uh, the other BQA principles are being applied in that environment. And this, again, takes about an hour uh, to get 100 head through the chute in a feedlot. We don't ask them to do anything different. We just want them to process the way they usually do. And <clears throat> we, uh, again, we're working for the feedlot in these things. We wanna make sure that they're, they're doing pretty close to what they normally do. It's impossible, we found out doing these with feedlots that uh, it's impossible to say, do exactly what you normally do because it, 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 you can't do that with uh, an extra person who you know is grading you standing in the room. You're, they're definitely trying to do their best work and that's fine. Uh, it really works out nice. The last part, which we figured out takes, give or take an hour or two, is driving around the yard and randomly selecting some pins to evaluate. The assessment requires 10 pins um, to be looked at carefully for things like mud scores and, and the availability of water and the condition of the feed and the apron. But overall, this process can be done, uh, I think, pretty handily in three hours, maybe a bit more, a bit less, depending on how quickly you get through them. So that's really the nuts and bolts of getting through an assessment. It's a half day or a little less. Um, it's, a, it's a relatively painless thing. And we actually had a lot of good discussions with the feedlots. So we're gonna talk a little bit more about the, uh, the value of those protocols. Rob, if you'll advance a slide for me. These things are, they seem like busy work and we really ran into that impression uh, as we've done these over the past few weeks. Um, Feedlots and the employees, managers, employees, owners, everybody kind of knows what they need to do. And writing it down seems like an extra step. Some people were concerned about it taking the ability for flexibility, or the, the capability to be flexible out of how they operate, especially given the, the environmental extremes that feedlots experience and some of the other uh, uncontrollable factors. But I think there is, there is a, a lot of value for SOPs. I don't think they need to be written down to the, the absolute uh, finest detail, but they do have value. One of the primary values and the reason we're doing a lot of this is because they do provide some assurances to our consumers that we actually have responded to what they're asking us to respond to. And that I think is what's driving JBS and Tyson and Cargill to, to implement some of these. But I would also argue that they're good for the feedlots. We had a couple of examples of feedlots who were using these SOPs as a way to retain information about how specific jobs get done, especially if an employee would leave or get sick or have to be gone for a day, that helps them fill those gaps temporarily. Or if someone quits or something like that, it was really useful. And we had a couple of people really excited about the potential to use these things to train new employees. And they also make pretty good evaluation tools to let new employees or existing employees know how they're doing and what they need to work on or, or what they're really doing a good job at. So I think they have value. We ran into a lot of concerns about labor and feedlots and SOPs provide an opportunity for an employee to know exactly what's expected of them. And I think in terms of employee retention, there's, uh, there's some upside to having these things written down. So uh, that's all I have for this part. Rob, do you have anything uh, concluding wise? I'm sure you've got some information about how to get one of these done. 
Yeah, uh, as far as uh, helping get these done, uh, we do have uh, all of the resources, of course, on the bqa.ungl.edu website. Uh, if you contact us, uh, we are happy to uh, try to work with you on trying to get some of these done. Uh, many of our consulting vets are willing to help walk through these with uh, their yards as well. And so uh, there's some opportunities. And like I said, if you uh, get a hold of us and extend uh, they will get in contact with me or Brian and and we will uh, work with you to try to help you get through these assessments and get on the national list as well. So with that, uh, I guess we can open up to questions. Nice job, guys. Um, I don't have any questions other than if they uh, like Rob mentioned, if you have questions, go to the BQA website. Um, you know, I guess Rob or, or Brian, one question would be, uh, why should they do it? Maybe rehash that. And, and what do you think uh, about timing? Oh, I can take a first shot at that, Rob. I, the reason I think this is very valuable is it, it gives you, especially if you use someone outside of your operation, to do this, it gives you a look at the operation from a very different perspective. We were able to address some things in doing these that were of concerns at different levels of the operation. Uh, we found that the concerns at management levels versus the employee levels were a little bit different, and this gave us the ability to interact with all those level, levels in a pretty structured way. Uh, we, we covered everything from employees and how to handle employees to euthanasia protocols and um, in, in one case, uh, there was some misunderstanding between the different levels of management about what was, or the, the management, the employees about what was happening. And this actually served to clarify that. So getting that external look is valuable. I think also as producers of food, this is, uh, an opportunity to hone our craft as, as beef producers, because that will become food for somebody. And these, Assessments provide consumers via, in this case, the, the packers, some assurance in a written um, standardized form that we're doing what we say we're doing and we're responding to the consumer's concerns. You know, these things cover everything from animal welfare to antimicrobial use. And those are pretty big topics for consumers right now. I think this is a really nice way to allow the feedlot to work on its, it, you know, to, to get some confirmation of its strengths, to work on some opportunities that exist that it's not currently taking advantage of. And it really, I think, firms up our, our place in the, in the food marketplace. And I, I would also uh, agree with Brian on that. It's, it really is a piece that our, our consumers are asking for, and it really helps us in that uh, world market in uh, assuring that we are doing the right things uh, and we are concerned with that. And so what the packers we are seeing that are, are starting to look at this as a requirement are looking at uh, within the next year to two years, having a majority of their supply coming from yards that have completed assessments or have really studied uh, and worked through assessments or an equivalent third party audit as well. Very good. Uh, Rob, go ahead a slide. If you uh, watch this and you would like to evaluate the program, um, please visit the go.unl.edu feedlot webinar 19 site and, and appreciate you watching this. We will have more webinars, <clears throat> more webinars the last Wednesday of each month here for a few months. And then, uh, and then they're always posted on our beef website at beef.unl.edu. Thanks.